Guru Nation, we are live. Happy Monday. If you do not like today, you need to do something different. That's um, your body and your soul way of telling you what are you doing. You know, if it's if you're pumped about Mondays, you're in the right place. So I got Dan Otap. This is a special episode because I've never had Dan on the show, but I've heard so many things about him from people that I trust and respect in the industry and they were all like you have to have dan on and i've i'm meeting dan because of the sos save our sites panel he's on the very last panel of the day on industry relationships and we got something special lined up for you guys there that'll be a prequel to the after party so there'll be some calls to action for you to implement some of the stuff you've learned uh during the after party which is like an hour after but so you're going to get to meet Dan soon if you're coming to SOS. People are pumped up about SOS, Dan. This is yeah. more than yeah, I imagined. I'm, seeing, I'm starting to see some of the activity online, and it's uh, it, it, you're, I do exactly what you're doing right now. You smile, right? Like, it's a good, yeah, a good yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, you go, we've been planning this over a year, and you kind of just see it as like this abstract idea. And now it's like, nope, Friday we're actually doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's real yeah. as it gets. So Dan will be there. Everybody go come connect with him. If, you, if you're not going to be able to be there, his LinkedIn is underneath this video in the show notes. Uh, Dan is a principal and alliance and partnerships lead at Genentech. And he, he has a pretty interesting career. Obviously, Genentech is one of the most innovative sponsors out there, um, but he also has had experience at academic medical centers with Columbia, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. He started out as a study assistant mm -hmm. back in the day, uh, which was back in the day, 2009. You know, I remember when that wasn't back in the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've, like we're becoming old. <laughs> <laughs> our beards industry. are a bit more gray yeah yeah that's right i remember when i was the young guy in the industry and now i'm just middle-aged it's interesting yeah industry relationships before we get into your career are you the type of guy who purposefully sought out relationships because i'm not okay i it happened yeah. to me on accident it happened because of the youtube yeah what about um, you it's a it's a really good question and and um you know i i things that i say this morning uh are on my own account i'm not speaking on behalf of genentech etc but um i it's an interesting question i would like to say and you'll probably hear it a little bit later I didn't intentionally get into clinical trial research. I'm sure that's a surprise to you, right? <laughs> um, I was a newlywed in New York City with my wife in grad school, and I needed to pay the bills because rent in New York is is a lot, right? So, ouch! Needing um, to pay I had bills a, a really good York friend City. of mine who I still am indebted to, Jenny Walzer, uh, who was a physician office assistant at Sloan Kettering, and she looked uh -huh. at me and she said, "You know, I I was in a, a master's cohort with her for general psych." And she said, you kind of look like you're neurotic a bit and you pay attention to details and you like things structured. So you might you might actually do good at this thing called research. And at that point, I didn't even know what Sloan Kettering was, let alone clinical trials. And the rest is the rest is history. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah. Those two words, those two phrases go going together is scary. Needing to pay bills and New York City. Yeah. <laughs> don't sound hey, at the, all. <laughs> it's the dream, man. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. So, so necessity, you're like, look, you you heard about it. You said, you know what? It sounds like there's opportunities. It sounds like eventually it'll pay well, which mm -hmm. you were right on both accounts. Um, interesting. But did you go into it once you started your research career? Did you go into it knowing that relationships are key to everything or did you kind of discover that accidentally no no so um the other thing is before i jump into this this is kind of like a surreal moment for me because if we're talking back circa 2009 uh you probably know where i'm going with this but you were 
I mean, you were the OG with this kind of stuff. So I, I jumped into this career full steam. I wanted to learn as much as I could. At that point in time, there was kind of a dearth of information, right? You were a shining kind of beacon there, and I'm not blowing smoke. Um, so this is this is a treat for me. I kind of feel honored. I've already told you I'm bringing my book to the conference, so I'll be holding it, and I, I want your autograph. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> sure. It Thank didn't you. start off. It, it actually didn't start off knowing that relationships were uh, the top driver, right? We all have our kind of career backgrounds, et cetera, and relationships are always important for me. To clarify also really quickly, I deal predominantly with site relations, right? So when we have a lot of alliance and partnership work, at least in the industry side, you're talking about either merger acquisition, uh, BD, or kind of exploratory work for partnership on molecules or assets. That's not the focus of my partnership kind of work. Mine is predominantly site facing. Uh, and we also work at a company that, that is global in nature. So I have partners in different countries that I also connect with. So. I didn't go into it knowing that relationships were paramount. I will tell you that I, I did go after this job knowing full well that relationships were paramount. So um, super quick, all of my background from the site side was oncology based. So, so cancer trials. Um, started out at Sloan Kettering in New York City, like we talked about in glioma research. So brain tumors, uh, industry sponsored, NCI sponsored. And, and my position was a research study assistant. So basically my my day job was entering data into CRFs at that point. It's going to date me a little bit. I still EDC was up, but I still had, you know, binders with carbon copy paper that I was filling out and initialing and striking through and uh, initial and dating per Alcoa. Um, but then, you know, my career started to build towards regulatory management, got recruited to Columbia. I was there for a number of years, uh, both in the Department of Neurology as well as their cancer center proper. Um, so I went there with uh, a neuro-oncologist by the name of Andrew Lassman, a uh, lovely, lovely mentor of mine. I uh, was there for about nine years and built um, with a, a team, was part of a fantastic team at, at Columbia University and Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. And then I took a, an opportunity across the work, across the country, and I was recruited over to City of Hope in in around Pasadena, like Southern California. Mm -hmm. And through the course of, and that was the last site facing position I had. Through the course of all of this, it became very air apparent to me that if you want to do clinical trials, one, they're super complex to begin with. Also, when you're dealing with oncology patients, there's even an additional layer. Uh, through the course of time, I got some exposure into early phase research, and then that's a whole new ball game. I'm not talking about early phase first in human slash healthy volunteer. I'm talking about oncology, early phase one kind of treatment interventional trials and relationships make the world go around in that setting. Like you can't, you can't have early phase research without very close connection with your research staff your sites, as well as investigators, uh, medical monitors and the sponsor leads, clinical scientists. Um, so as I was kind of steeped in that background on the site side, um, there were some really clear low hanging fruit opportunities. And and I was, you know, I saw an opening at, at Genentech and I had worked with them previously with uh, individuals like John Talbot, who's my executive director and Amber Gadbury, uh, she's been in the in the industry. If you haven't interviewed her, you should. She's she's been honestly amazing. Have not. Um, and and I saw an opening in their team, and I said, "Yeah, I, this is something I'd like to do." Because they proved to me that they were a sponsor that actually listened when we said, "Hey, this this process isn't working," or "Hey, we're having this difficulty." There's a lot of time, and we we still have a lot to benefit and do. I'm now three years into Genentech, but um, there's a lot of improvement that we need. Um, I think the day any of us start stop learning is the day we should probably consider a different um, a different job. But it it struck me as a company that that really did um, kind of hold true to to saying, look, we're we're going to try to do this in a in a patient slash site centric approach. And if I have the opportunity in my career to help move that needle, that's that's where I'm going to feel most impactful and 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 proud. Shout out to Genentech for doing this. There are only a few sponsors that do this. And I didn't realize that um, that is your day job at Genentech. Yeah. Um, I'm a side owner, by the way, Dan. 
Oh, yeah. to meet you. We can get some studies over here. And you, uh, you know, <laughs> underserved. What kind of therapeutic areas is it across the board? Or yeah, yeah. So um, again, I'm, I can't speak on behalf of Genentech in, at large, but anything that's in the public domain is perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Um, our group, the group that I work in, is early phase focused. So it's G Red. I'll save you the very complex interworkings of how Roche and Genentech and Shugai and other companies work together, but. Uh, I'm involved right now. I'm assigned to a geographical region known as the Americas. So that's Canada, U.S., Central, Latin America, and it's TA agnostic. So we have our oncology pipeline, and then we also have our uh, I2ON or Omni pipeline, which is basically everything non-oncology. And it ranges from respiratory ailments that I'm also working on an alliance on, right? So uh, looking at different different centers across the globe to kind of build out strong alliance relationships for the therapeutic area of respiratory disease, um, all the way to, you know, first in human uh, healthy volunteer. We have our, we have a phenomenal group in our uh, early phase division for clinical operations that's fully dedicated to healthy volunteer research because it's so drastically different. Um, So we have some incredible, incredible people in those teams doing some work there. Uh, But my day job, I'm a director of the Expanded Oncology Network, which is a GRED driven site alliance network that's global in nature, phenomenal centers. uh, And really the whole focus of that group is partnering with the investigators and the site staff to really kind of uh, set both relationships bi-directionally up for success, right? If you need to work on a master, if we need to use some trainings or, or documents that the site has kind of developed over the years and ensure that our partners, either Genentech or those that we delegate work to know those sites processes in a way and respect their processes. Um, and uh, that's that's predominantly my my initial day job. Uh, so director of the Eon network. I then am again starting some work in the respiratory space. There's also that kind of ongoing relationship management between sites in general, right? You don't necessarily have to be an alliance center to, to necessarily need and require a strong relationship with a sponsor to be successful in tro- clinical trials. So across that geographic unit, um, Alexandra Mullaney is my director in that area and they they run the global relationship network. So Genentech is pretty, pretty deeply committed to relationship management. Um, it is above molecule, if you know, if anybody knows that phrase, which means it's not tethered to a specific medication in development. Um, some people view that as a positive, uh, some people view that as a, as a watch out, but for our division and our purposes, we're basically across to TA ranging from asthma, COPD, all the way to ocular melanoma. Well, we definitely got to talk, Dan, cause I'm in charge. My day job's in charge of getting studies for my site. Uh, let's, I'm let's sure connect. a lot of them are. I, I know, I know where you'll be <laughs> Thursday, Friday. So yeah. Man, I know where you'll be, Dan, and especially on panel six. You can't, you can't escape, Dan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, all seriousness, Dan. Um, why I've noticed that I don't know if it's the smarter, the more innovative sponsors are doing this um, site relationships. They call it different things, but essentially, yeah. it's getting to know, having someone in charge, or even a department in charge of knowing the community-based sites, mm-hmm. or even um helping to develop maybe yeah maybe not yeah. like formally but letting a community physician know hey like research is a real thing you, in your yeah. community there are there is infrastructure to be able to do it uh i think it's in their advantage they being the big pharma to do this but why aren't more doing it number 1 and number 2 it used to be that the CROs would kind of be tasked with this stuff. Is that, did you, not Genentech, when I say you, but did pharma just discover it's not enough to rely on mm-hmm. outsourced companies to do this? Yeah. So you have a lot of, you have a lot of good questions and there's a lot of threads <laughs> to pull there on that sweater, right? Um, let's start with, um, Let's start with if sponsors, like, like not all sponsors do this. So yeah. it's interesting, right? I have really close colleagues, uh, Jennifer Durasky and other other individuals in the industry, uh, you know, Carrie Gorman. A lot of these folks 
live and breathe this type of work and know that relationship management is really where things are are at for us. If you have a problem as a site, you need somebody who can kind of be the escalation point, right? That's the easiest way of explaining it, but there's so much more to that. So why it goes back to, this is just my opinion, right? And you know, everybody has opinions. Yeah. When it comes to the way that this is being managed, it's if companies are reworked and everything, you know, has a, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If you have no, uh, margin, there's no mission, all these kind of phraseologies that you hear throughout the, the zeitgeist of where we work. Um, if you have an above molecule or, or not something that's tethered directly to a, a drug and development, that's that's a watch out because you don't have funds that are fully dedicated to that in a way that is tethered to some type of drug in development. So a program, right? This is above program work. Those are the easiest, maybe, kind of groups to look at and go under scrutiny to say, oh, well, if it's a need to have and we need to create, you know, downsize or streamline or transform, those types of groups sometimes come up in conversation going, okay, well, if, if it's not tethered to molecule X, Y, and Z, we really need to cut our costs. Let's really go lean. You see where things go in that direction. So there, it might be simple business strategy, um, it is a massive commitment, I think, on any company's levels. And there are some companies that have really done this brilliantly. Like, you just look at the SMILE program. It's like a wonderful concept. Um, and it is valuable. But it's it's it goes back to that age-old question, which we all know that relationships make the world go round. And that sounds kind of kumbaya and yay. But it's more than that. And there are times where it, it, this concept of relationship management in and of itself is a massive capital commitment. Um, it takes, you know, I have a, I, I sit on a group of, you know, seven plus people. Those are FTEs. Those are, those are, those are full-time salaried benefited folks. And um, that's a, that's a commitment from a company. So um, I is think that, that your it, team, that's those seven are your team. Well, I sit on the team. So okay. yeah, we're okay. part of our team that, that handle global relationship management, but I think first and foremost, it has to do with the way that a, a lot of our companies are resourced. Um, CROs do a brilliant job of this. I know I, I'm not going to be the guy who feels like I truly honestly believe that everybody who is trying to do their damnedest and their best comes in the work and tries to bring their whole self to the office. Whether you're at a CRO, whether you're at a sponsor, whether you're at a site, whether you're an inspector, uh, an auditor, whatever it is. Um, and it's, it's sometimes very, it's, it's challenging, but I think it's, it's definitely worth the hard work, but it is, it is definitely something that is going to take capital and, and, and resource to continue to stand up and, and, um, go through. <clears throat> but they clearly see the ROI in it. And is it, is this like one of those Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like probably the ultimate level where you've already achieved your other basic needs and you have time to be able to do this. Cause that's where a lot of these cliches and kumbayas come from. It's like, they're actually like true. No one's disagreeing with it, but where most people have gripes or concerns is, Hey, that's true, but that's for them. Not for me right now. I'm just trying to survive. I know, and I think I know. you guys are at the point where you have that luxury, which is a yeah. good thing. No, that's a that's a really good call out. Um, and I love the reference to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because I, interestingly enough, uh, a good colleague of mine, um, I know I'm dropping a lot of names, so forgive me, but Nick Sahara works on my team. Uh, I work with him and he came up with this really, really beautiful um, visual. And a lot of it, honestly, if you flip it around, could be pulled out of a psych textbook that you took in Psych 101 about Maslow. And I'm like, this makes sense. And you're spot on. You're spot on with, um, it is. It's basically, you look at these alliances and they're sites that we've definitely had work with. We definitely like to work with and, and we'll continue to work with. Whether it, because, uh, whether it be because of uh, clinical expertise in a specific disease area with a doctor who's a, a physician scientist or physician investigator. Um, or where I get really excited is partnering with really brilliant minds on the site administration side, right? Those that 
you and I could rattle off a lot of acronyms and that person on the other end would just keep up. They know what Alcoa is. They know what e e EDC are. All of these, what a 483 is, like all these kind of things. Um, those are the ones that I like clearly partnering with even most because that's kind of where my career background is, right? Like, um, so sites with both strong clinical leadership and investigator leadership, um, all the way down to the, the data entry managers um, and the way in which people structure their clinical trial units and their clinical trial offices, leadership in that space, partnering with those individuals is actually probably the most fun part of my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I want to get into like a little bit of your your day to day at yeah. Genentech. But before that, so this analogy of like companies, they do this when they can afford it and all that stuff. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Individuals are the same, by the way, like this translates directly to job seekers. There's going to be a good amount of them, I believe, at SOS. And mm. panel one is panel one's kind of for you guys. So be ready. But so is panel six, and that's the one where Dan is on. Uh, individuals looking for jobs say, yeah, you know, all this networking is nice. You telling me not to spam people, uh, to leave comments, to get to meet people. It's all nice, but I got to pay my bills and I need yeah. a job. It's the same thing. It's You have to get to that point where you recognize this is important. And even if you may not have the time for it, you need to make time for it because it really is the end game. There's no reason why Genentech would be doing this stuff unless it's worth their while. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good call. Now your day to day, can you walk me through this? Cause this sounds like a dream job for many. It probably is. In <laughs> fact, I would, I would be remiss to say that I'm not in my dream job right now. I will say that. Um, so, I mean, in a nutshell, what my day-to-day -day is committed to is helping oversee the strategy and day-to-day -day operations of this early phase oncology alliance. Uh, so we have staff across the, the globe that are interacting with our sites in different local regions. They're mainly handling issue escalation at any given time or dealing with what strategic plan has been put in place because this network, if it's working perfectly, uh, is connecting with the sites that are part of that membership and building out plans for the year. And again, to go back to this phraseology of, you know, asset tied or molecule tied to above molecule, when we talk about a, a, a site plan for these groups that are part of the membership, it's really what do they see as an a institutional priority? Yeah. Whether it be the way they structure or the way they enact their delegation logs, the way they do startup something. Um, if they're looking to pilot or if they're looking to really work with a sponsor that's willing to kind of listen and go, okay, well, we haven't done it this way, but let's see what we can do here and see if what we can align with. Um, those are the kind of interactions that my teams handle. We also handle everything from, you know, standard issue escalation, like where's the EKG machine? It was delivered on Fifth Street, it was supposed to be delivered on 7th. So they help oh, study you get that nitty gritty like that. They that do. Level. They do. And in fact, some of, sometimes it's it's that level of in the weeds. I, I used to be a, 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 a server and a, a bartender. So getting in the yeah. weeds, right, quote unquote, um, that makes our job so exhilarating because when you have it, you have it linked to either a program, a protocol, a study or even more so a lot of our staff, you know, are dealing with something that has an individual or a family at the end of what they're trying to do. So you, you basically try to do everything in your power to figure out how to make it work. Everything from drug being imported into countries and we have to figure out logistics there because labeling is something off. It's a really kind of like a air traffic controller type job um, where individuals that have pretty deep learning in a clinical trial operation space, right? Like I'm three years into industry. Um, but before that, I've been tried and true and done everything from data entry, regulatory submissions, you know, written up the ICFs, responded to the IRBs, communicated about invoices, like you name it, we've done it, but we bring that type of knowledge to the setting and then bring groups together like these dedicated CROs, the sites, the leaders, and try to figure out basically how to smooth things out. Um, I don't like living in a scenario where you put out fires. I prefer to be much more upstream um, than that. So I'd like to have kind of 
you know, uh, work that goes into it. So we try to avoid as many fires, but you and I both know, we never know what the heck's going to happen in clinical trials. And then you're dealing with, you're right. dealing with human beings on top of that. Yeah. Um, so clinical trials, we try to control the environment as much as possible, but it's life, right? Somebody's going to lose something on the bus or leave their pill diary on a, on a, you know, a, Things uh, happen. A subway or the e diary or and just we have last to just week figure out how to deal with it. Just last week at my site, we're still trying to hunt solve this problem. We had investigational product shipped, uh, maybe for the sixth time by the same sponsor. No yeah. issues the first five. The sixth time was around the holidays, and they're like, Yeah, why didn't you put in the IRT? Well, we never got it. Where was it sent? Uh, we're not sure where it was sent, but this person signed for it. Oh my. We've never heard of this person. <laughs> so where is it? You know, and we're dealing with that right now. Like these are things that sites deal with on a daily basis. Yeah. So we have and to, to clarify, we do have fully dedicated study teams at Genentech that are that are listed, you know, or, or assigned to that program. But when it comes to the sites that we have these relationships with, it's a combination of both the site uh, study team working with us uh, and the Genentech study teams as well as relationship managers who may know something about that site or a connection with a different department or something that'll just help. It's, it's our job to really try to provide the smoothest experience for those, for those accounts, if you will, or those institutions. Yeah. Um, and what yeah, you... there are days where you get into the nitty gritty and the weeds. And then there are other days where you're very high level and you're, you're simply just trying to talk about, um, you know, pipeline presentations and, and what's in the pipeline coming up. What you just, well, your career so far exemplifies, and you're young, so you're just getting started, but I hope this is, this continues to be a trend for sponsors. I have this theory that technology helps sponsors get more control back of their mm -hmm. studies, because for the last two decades, the CROs have basically run a monopoly on we have control over your, your study. Don't worry. Kick mm -hmm. your feet up, sponsor. Go do what you're supposed to do. Go do your core competencies. But then the FDA came in through a curveball and said, well, sponsor is the one responsible for oh, yeah. the study. At the same time, technology is helping sponsors be more involved. At the same time, the smart ones like you guys are seeing this, reading the tea leaves and saying, hey, maybe we should be more active and have entire departments dedicated to this. You, Your career, your job right now, that is a coordinator's dream job. And I've been told that a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my question is, like, maybe the coordinators out there, because the old paradigm was work really hard, be a coordinator, maybe be a site director if you want to stay at the site, if you want to get entrepreneurial, Maybe start your own site. Mm -hmm. If you just want to climb the corporate ladder, be a CRA. And then who knows where that's going to take you. But this is something completely new. And you, it's not just sponsors. It's also vendors that are doing this. They yeah. they only will hire. Like I know Viva, SiteVault, uh, Creo. These yeah. are a few of the vendors I know that they hire specifically site people. Only. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you, Genentech, I don't know what their hiring policy is, but your career, entire career prior to sponsor was site. So mm -hmm. do you think this is something that could grow as a trend and more CRCs have just even more alternatives now to be excited about? It's a, I think it's a double-edged sword question, right? And, and let me, let me explain why I say it. I will tell you that I am, by no means an island just like thomas merton said no man's an island but so i i wouldn't say i'm the bell curve in the industry but i wouldn't say that i'm fully like a trailblazer pioneer i have many colleagues that have kind of made a move from site side to industry also have colleagues interestingly enough that have gone from industry or cro and moved into the sites um but the reason I call it a double-edged sword is, I mean, dealing with everything from, say, like AACI task forces in cancer, you see this natural progression that you called out where there was a kind of a, a, a mentality where if you did good work at a site and you were a stellar CRC or stellar RSA, 
you do that for a year, do that for two years, and then your next goal is not internal. Your next goal is to try to get into the CRA role at a CRO. And then from there, the sky's the limit, right? Because salary increase, you know, travel, these kind of things. Um, that that may have happened. I think that's going to happen. I think if anybody is a hustler, if you will, like a, a like a really go-getter, proactive individual, if that's what they want in their career, that's what they want. I will tell you wholeheartedly, I did not think I would ever be on the industry side. I thought I was going to be at an academic medical center for the duration of my career. Honestly, in my perfect world, it would have been some type of either clinical trial office director uh, at a cancer center, um, working with really phenomenal staff ranging from clinical research nurses, investigators, junior investigators, data coordinators, regulatory, like you cut me, I bleed regulatory. I'm a, I'm a, a nerd when it comes to the code of federal regulations, OHRP, like I love the stuff, right? Um, but it just by happenstance in my career, it, even during COVID, like during a pandemic, I switched, I switched my role. Um, that was huge. And everybody's narrative is unique and everybody's story is, is their own. Um, but what I will say is, is it's a dream, it's a dream job and I'm not here to sell a position, right? But I am saying that it, there's something new every day. That something new may be a challenge. So that's another thing, like get ready, tie your shoes and go to work. You gotta, you gotta, if it's Monday, I'm excited to your point earlier, I am excited to be at work um, because every day is different. And this, this is not a cliche, like it's genuine, genuine. Mm -hmm. um, do I see it continuing? Yeah, I see it continuing because honestly, it's like with anything, um, if you have a person that that's very uh, proactive, driven and, and good at what they do, there's going to be a logical progression. A good coordinator would be a heck of a CRA who then in turn would be a great auditor at a certain point, right? Or, And it just builds from there. Where I'm interested in is trying to take a couple steps back and look and say, well, okay, rather than having sites always be, you know, frustrated with losing their staff if they have CROs or, or others come to their site and work really good working relationships and you're like the largest enroller on one of these phase three trials and you have a coordinator who's like knocking it out of the park and then lo and behold, six months later, that coordinator goes over to the CRO that you had. Like, I get it. I've, I've seen it. I've been there. I've done that. The first six months of my, within the first six months of my career in clinical trials, I was embedded in an NCI audit that changed the way in which I worked and it set my career up for a trajectory. So mm -hmm. those of you or those of us who go through those kind of things, it, it deepens your knowledge. It, it heightens your awareness. It, it kind of I, it probably amplifies your level of urgency. So, so there's good things. I view them as good things. We have to figure out as a group that we're probably, and, and Sean Soth from SCRS mentioned this uh, and, and still to this day probably mentions it. We all sit in a very unique industry. Everybody's going to have opinions about this, but I, you can't be, you can't be a sponsor and not have sites and you can't be a site and not have patients. And um, everything is so interdependent um, and interlinked in this, in this group that, that I think it's unique. It's a unique industry in that space. It's complicated. If it wasn't complicated, all of us probably would, you you wrote the book on it and we'd be done and, and you'd close the door and you know we'd be over. It's yeah. not how it is. And it's, it's always gonna be complicated. And as new things happen like decentralization or hybridization of trials, there are going to be unknowns and they're going to need to be people like yourself and others, those that are listening to come up with the solutions that are needed to make those things work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think this interconnective interconnectivity amongst stakeholders like sponsors, sites, CROs, patients, vendors, maybe it is unique. I've only been in this industry, so I don't really understand the other industries that well um, as this one, but do you think that ever, gets less complex like do you do you think there's a world i feel like dct was an attempt to make it less interconnected yeah. and it's early but i think it's didn't work uh <laughs> what do you think about this and i don't mean to be the one doing all the talking but uh so <laughs> 
I think DCT was an attempt to look at things in a new way and try, and it still is ongoing. Yep. Uh, just chat with your close friend, Craig Lipset and others. Um, what up, Craig? It, <laughs> it, it, it's a, I think it's a necessity at this point. I think like back in 2009, right. To, to, to go back, social media was nowhere near where it is today at all. No, no, so much no. so that like you, it, it was just completely different. So now even the LinkedIn landscape has changed. I, I think, I think the concept, and I've been in the conferences and in these discussions when we first started to have decentralized trial attempts and, and some of the phraseology that was embedded in that, if you remember, were things like sightless trials. And a lot of us from the site side were like, ouch. Well, it, exactly. That hurt. Exactly. It exactly. hurt my feelings, guys. And, <laughs> and, and I was, I mean, during that time, I was at the site and I remember thinking, well, there's no way, like, you, but this is just my <laughs> opinion. Like, you can't, you can't do that, especially if it's in the, the, the nuances or under the guise of like an oncology study. Right. Like, yeah. a, like a cancer patient. So you're not going to have a cancer patient treated in such a way that they don't have some physical conduct with a with an investigator or doctor, even if it's your standard of care doctor. It's just the way it is. It's the, it's the zeitgeist. So um, so there is a lot of missteps, but I think we've kind of continued to kind of move in a positive direction. DTRA and others like I am very, very excited. I, I still remain a hopeful cynic, if you will. Um, but I, I do believe that it's going in the right direction for the right reasons, further complicated by a U.S. healthcare setting, but I will digress there. Um, <laughs> but I, I do, I don't believe it's done yet, but I also want to call out the fact that some of these, there's the concept of GCP. You guys, we rise and fall on ICH GCP. That's what, you know, you know, basically I, I'll get a tattoo of GCP on my back. Wow. E6R2 or something, right? Wow. But big time. The other thing that I've mentioned before for me, which is really kind of corny, but I like the idea of GCS, which is good common sense. And some of these, so so without throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater, there are certain things with GCP that we're doing that, that are just common sense. Hi, hybrid clin clinical trials to me make common sense. So if sure. I, and for those who, that don't know my story, um, and it's, it's, neither here nor there, but I grew up very rural. I grew up in a, in a rural part of upstate New York. Um, when people got sick, and I've, I've mentioned this on other podcasts, and I definitely mentioned this during during conversations, if you got very sick, like legitimately sick, you, you had to drive or you had to, sometimes they would fly, but you're going to New York City or you're going to Boston, somewhere like that. You're not staying in Plattsburgh, you know, like as, as, as amazing as those doctors are in that hospital, they're going to look at specialists they're gonna in the very least say go across the lake and go to go to uvm university of vermont um so there's this this lack of ability which i think you alluded to earlier this lack of ability for patients in those smaller areas and rural areas to get the same access that others that may live in metropolitan areas etc have just by the nature of the beast um I, I grew up with that first and foremost. It's one of the things why I even initially took an executive director position for community practice at City of Hope. I knew that 80 to 85 percent of at least cancer patients were treated in the community setting. Those that are definitely non-academic medical centers, that's you're going to go where your local doctor is first and foremost. And then if it raises to a certain certain threshold, then you'll go to the specialist. Then you guys will pack in a car and drive down to Boston or drive up to Boston and drive down to New York. But there's a logical progression here. Figuring out how, especially in the later phase settings, which I think a lot of my colleagues in the industry are probably looking at the most applicable is later phase for this kind of conversation. If you're looking at early signal seeking in or tox finding in, in medications and doses, they usually like to kind of keep their trials a little bit more towards the larger academic medical centers or specialized centers like the starts and the next of the world and cancer. But at the end of the day, it's a medication that hopefully will benefit a patient regardless of where they live. But getting that medication to those areas has been a little bit difficult that are a little less metropolitan and more rural in nature. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, the, the idea of decentralized trials is here to stay. 
I just think that when we initially, just like anything, you gotta you gotta crawl before you walk, before you run, before you sprint. Um, there were some missteps in this in this process, but I think it all comes down to putting certain individuals at the center of what you're trying to do. And what I mean by that is sponsors hopefully putting patients at the center of what they're trying to think of. And you cannot, which this is a phrase that has also become cliche, but wholeheartedly, I believe you cannot be patient centric without being site centric. You can't. If I make your life and your staff's life easier, Dan, guess what? The patient's lives are going to be easier as well. Yeah. If yeah. I'm complicating by giving you 14 different devices and I won't go down this road too much, but if I'm doing that and giving you so many different things and then you guys have to be Apple tech bar geniuses in addition to data coordinators, I'm complicating a system, but I could talk about that too yep. long, probably rant. So no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And not only would our patients lives be easier, but we can service more patients in the same I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. So as we wrap up, because I know you got to go, you got to get to work. Um, if a site's watching, listening, and wants to work with Genentech, first of all, what do you look for in them? And then how can they get a hold of yeah. you guys? So to give a disclaimer, I'm not going to, I'm not speaking on behalf of Genentech, but I can say this. I remember I had a very close mentor of mine years ago. Uh, when I first started to go into early phase research and he said, Dan, sponsors are looking for really basic things. Sponsors are looking for transparency. So when we do these feasibilities, which we know, we got to work on these feasibilities. I, 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 if you see any of where my mind is at, um, I really want to actually be a part of a larger group. I don't care if it's our company or others in a conglomerate, but we got to do something different about startup because I feel like it's been going on since 2009 way before I started, but it's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, do we have to do something about startup, but sponsors are looking for sites that are very transparent in their numbers and, and produce on what they say they they can do. So they don't over promise and under deliver, right? That's basic common sense, right? Go back to GCS. Mm -hmm. The other thing is know, kind of know what your site's value is. And, and what I mean by that is like, what's, in cancer, you reference it as a catchment area, but catchment areas become kind of a nomenclature that's common. Like, who are the patient population that you're seeing and really treating, right? Like, I don't necessarily need to know. I should know as a sponsor what your general demographic looks like in that local region. But I also want to know what patients are coming in your door or if it's a research center, what types of populations are coming in your door. Um, so know thyself. It's kind of like going back to the Oracle at Delphi for those who, who like philosophy, like know thyself, know yourself and know your strengths, um, transparency, know your strengths. And then also um, really robust systems. To me, I got to be honest, I come from a background of quality assurance in the clinical trial space. One of the mm -hmm. jobs that I helped kind of build at Columbia's Cancer Center was a compliance division. Um, that means you have robust systems and then you have robust teams that can train on those systems so that people reproduce very high quality responses. Um, dig into that, leverage that. You don't have to have off the shelf SOPs, but you should have some SOPs. If I don't see an SOP on informed consent or non-English speaking consent or you know, uh, documentation of AEs or the processing of SAEs, you can see from a distance as a sponsor, and I'm sure as a CRO, you can see sites that really have started to build out infrastructure that's conducive to high quality, uh, very structured, reproducible results, regardless of what TA the trial's in that you're going into that center. Um, and yeah, sorry if I feel like, if you feel like I'm all over the place, I'll try to summarize in threes because I like things in threes. Uh, transparency. Uh, know thyself, so know what what your strengths are, what disease areas, and and hold true to those. Uh, and then the other, which is interesting, is be open, be open to opportunities where they arise. Um, and I, it sounds so simplistic, and I've I've said this before. There are times where people have asked, "Yeah, do you have a dream job?" I do, and it's it's simple. You put, <laughs> and I I say this candidly, you put the other person ahead of you. Like you, you figure out ways of knowing that dance fair is more important than me. 
in whatever way I can do to service and, and help your life get better, at the end of the day, the chips are going to fall in the right direction. So I think sponsors are looking for, and that's my own kind of mantra, but I think sponsors yeah. are looking for transparency, uh, individuals that know what their what their business kind of strengths are and weaknesses, therefore, um, and then ultimately a willingness to communicate, like it, it, to know, like at the end of the day, um, we all are going to have these foxhole moments in research where IP is shipped in the wrong place and you don't know where it is. You got to figure it out. Like, I feel yeah. like a lot of what we do half the time is kind of MacGyver. I'm dating myself by referencing that, uh, but that show MacGyver growing up where he had bubble gum duct tape and like a pen. Um, yep. There are times where I, I remember in a coordinator role doing or feeling like I was MacGyver. Um, I think sponsors are looking for sites that are structured in such a way that they create control within the chaotic environment that we work. Uh, yes, it's very regulated, but it's also human driven. So when you start throwing humans in the mix, it can get very messy. It can get messy. Thank you so much, Dan. That last, that last thing you said about giving more than you receive or more than you ask, um, that's our panel, basically. Yeah. Panel six without giving away surprises for people and for you. I think it's a surprise to you guys too, but it'll be cool. It, that is the theme. And like this LinkedIn user said, you're right, Dan. I think he's talking to you. There are more people in the field for the pay than passion. Mm. But what makes you not a commodity, either as a person or a company or whatever, is your willingness to go out and make someone's life a little better, someone's job a little easier, whatever that is, in exchange for really nothing. Yeah, but in, at the end of the day, it's in exchange for everything because that is going to be your mo. That's going to be what you're known as, mm -hmm. and it's so counterintuitive because everyone's trying to get theirs. But really, yeah. that's the winning strategy. That's the winning ticket right there. No, of course, I know that. I know that we have to close, but I'd be remiss to not say this out loud. This has been. I said it before, and I'll say it again, and I'll probably tell you in Tucson. Um, what you and others, and Dr. Fox, um, you know, Brad and, and others have done is is quite remarkable. Um, none of us from the industry would, would be going if we didn't truly believe in the power of communication and talking. And being on this podcast is a dream of mine. Um, so I feel very blessed and lucky, right? I have a dream job and now I'm. this is a, another example of how my job is a dream. Thank you. Um, but what you've done in the industry, I, I'm sure you're you, you were told this a lot. Um, you helped, I think, set the trajectory of where we are today and broad and communication patterns. I think a lot of us, I mean, I saw that comment about, you know, some people are in it for the pay, for the passion. I am, I am hellaciously passionate. Um, I think people who, who get around me can, can sense that after a while, right. Or, or maybe after two minutes. Um, I feel like we work in probably the most rewarding industry. And whether you're on the site, whether you're a CRO, whether you're a sponsor, uh, I'm ex I'm super excited and ecstatic to be going to the inaugural, you know, SOS conference. And I, I consider myself lucky. Um, and I, I just, from my side of the fence to yours, I, I, I'm just super grateful for what you and others have done. Um, I think a lot of us are very passionate about this and you've created forums that we can actually talk about things and hopefully hopefully come out with some real solutions and, and some impactful, you know, progress. Yes. No, thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. And we're look like getting to meet people like you, right. I would have never, who knows when we would have actually agree yeah. talked if it wasn't for this panel. So I do think that giving back, like not every activity needs to be ROI driven, mm. but the, the mosaic that you paint with these little micro transactions will eventually build itself like the universe just kind of tends to gravitate towards that kind of energy so that's been my thesis since the beginning and seems like you're right in the same place uh as far as school of thought so trying we try yeah, yeah no thank you dan i really appreciate it and looking forward to meeting this is the beginning of our relationship yeah honestly yeah. so that's you know that's this is why i do it too to get to meet people like you and I know there's like-minded people in this space. So thank you so much for coming on and thank sharing. You. Going coordinators, I think, another opportunity and showing sites 
what they need to be doing. Um, really cool stuff, man. And everybody come connect with Dan at SOS. And if you're watching this later, his LinkedIn's underneath. There'll be another SOS. He goes to conferences, I think, all the time. No? <laughs> Not all the time, but we'll 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 connect. Connect with him somewhere, guys. If yeah. nowhere else in the ether webs. Thank you all for right. watching. Thank you, Dan, so much for coming Thank on. You guys. Everybody, like, subscribe, comment, share. Take it easy. Bye bye.